functions of the nervous system are sensory input, right, receiving information from our environment, from our own body, different parts of our body, then integration, right, processing that information, and then motor output, right, so sending signals from the brain out to the body to do things, whether that be to our salivary glands to make and secrete the saliva, whether that be to my biceps muscle to contract and move my forearm, right, those are kind of the three basic functions of the nervous system. So this week, just because it's really cool and interesting, we're going to take a deeper dive into sensory stuff, right? So this is sensory or afferent. This is information that's traveling from parts of the body into the spinal cord and the brain, okay? And we have all these different um, ways to get information about our outside environment as well as things that are going on inside our bodies. And so we'll talk about those today. Before we get started, just a little COVID update. Um, not looking good, right? So similar to others I said to you last week, uh, cases in the county are exploding. Uh, I have a good friend who's a nurse and uh, one of his friends got really sick with COVID and needed to be in the ICU and all the ICUs around here were full and so we had to be shipped off to La Crosse because that was the closest ICU that still had beds available. So our hospital leaders are pleading with people to please back up, mask up, wash up, right? So um, do all the things that we know decrease the transmission and the spread of this virus uh, because our medical systems are getting overwhelmed, right? Which is what we want to avoid because then we have unnecessary deaths, right? And if you have a heart attack, but the hospital's full, or you call for the ambulance, but they're busy transporting somebody to La Crosse, right? So then we start getting bad outcomes because we don't have the capacity to provide all the medical care that we need. So that is what's happening in Dunham County. Uh, we're starting to see the stout numbers tick up again. Right, they're still really low compared to when I remember very well when we were diagnosing 20 to 40 people a week at the Student Health Center. Um, so we're a far cry from that, but they're starting to tick up again. And you can see kind of the positivity rates for the screening testing that's happening are also edging up. So this is impacting our campus a little bit as well. Uh, so again, continued mask wearing, not visiting with people who aren't part of your household would be super helpful. All right, vaccines are coming along. This is, you know, there's, it's, it's a complicated process. We need to make sure they're both effective and safe. So Pfizer just announced this week in a press release. So this is not a scientific study. They haven't actually shared any of their data, so we can't actually look at it and see what it means. But they are saying that their vaccine looks to be 90% effective. Now that's really, really good for a vaccine, right? So we have some vaccines that are that effective, like for measles, uh, but most of them are not, right? So the standard influenza vaccine is usually around 50 to 60% effective, um, which is still way better than nothing, which is why we still recommend you get them. It's very helpful. Um, but this is kind of, you know, huge and would be really awesome. So just to remind you, the way this vaccine works, it's one of the mRNA vaccines. If we were way back, so we talked about different parts of the cell, so RNA is a molecule that's very similar to DNA, but it's just single-stranded. And we use it for a couple of different things. mRNA is messenger RNA, and it is the molecule that the DNA in the nucleus produces to then travel out into the cell and give that message, send a message to the cell about what it needs it to do. So mRNA serves as an instruction for the creation of a protein. So what they've done, which is groundbreaking actually, is that they have created a string of mRNA that they'll inject into your muscle, right? Just like you get any other vaccine. Once it's inside those muscle cells, that mRNA tells your cells, your ribosomes, to make the spike protein, to actually make that little bit of bling that antigen that is on the surface of the SARS-CoV-2 or the COVID virus, right? So most vaccines until now, what we've done is we've manufactured 
the antigen by growing the virus in chicken eggs or something. And then we bust apart the virus just to get those pieces of it that we want, the antigen, the protein, the spike protein. Right? But what they're doing now is they're using your own cells to produce that protein that then your immune system will attack and learn how to target and eliminate. So it's a really groundbreaking way of doing a vaccine, right? of having your own cell actually make the protein, make the antigen that we want to train the immune system to learn to recognize and eliminate. One of the limitations, however, how do you keep mRNA stable? And how do you inject it? And so they put it in these little nanoparticles. And the trick with the Pfizer vaccine is it requires storage at negative 70 degrees centigrade. Oh my gosh, <laughs> right? So most clinics don't have freezers that will keep it at negative 70, right? And there's supply chain issues here too, right? We have to keep it frozen through all of its transportation, right? So it moves from manufacturing to the wholesaling, to the distribution centers, to the clinics. So um, from a logistical standpoint, the mRNA vaccines will be a little bit challenging to say the least. Yeah. So um, is it possible to insert a screen or uh, an antibodies to fight the antigen? Is it possible to just no, so it's a good question. So instead of training our immune system to recognize and fight the spike protein, could we just block where the spike protein normally goes? So remember, it goes to the ACE2 receptors. That's what it attaches to to get into our cell. We need those ACE2 receptors for ACE2 to bind to, which is a hormone that helps regulate blood pressure. So unfortunately, we can't block the receptor site. Tricky, tricky. Viruses. Are there questions about COVID? You're like, I'm so sick of it. Me too. <laughs> but it's going to be with us for quite some time. All right, let's talk about our senses. Right? Senses are often delightful, sometimes agonizing. Right? So this is how we interact with, this is how we get information from the world, from our external environment and how we get information from within our own body, right? So remember, this is capturing information about our surroundings and about our own body. And so in order to do this, we're going to have specialized sensory receptors. Now, the trick here is the word receptors is used in different ways. So remember, we just talked about the ACE2 receptor. That's a receptor that's on a cell surface that allows something to bind to it. This is different. When we say a sensory receptor, we're not talking about something on a specific cell. We're talking about a feature of the nervous system that allows us to sense or detect something. So it's a different use of the word receptor, which is tricky. Right? So those sensory receptors, which are usually parts of sensory neurons, okay, we're then going to send those signals to specific regions of the brain. So depending on what type of sense it is and what location in which we are sensing it, it will go to different parts of the brain. So part of what we're talking about is what parts of our brain receive these sensory signals from different types of senses and different locations of senses. And you might remember the thalamus. So the thalamus is that part of the brain in the middle that kind of acts like a triage sensor. And it decides what are we going to pay attention to and what are we not going to pay attention to, right? So we're having all this input constantly, right? I've got this thing around my neck. I've got my sweater sleeves coming down onto my palm. That's kind of annoying, right? I have all different types of sensory input coming in. What am I paying attention to? What am I not, right? So that's my thalamus is going to help me do that. Most sensory information is going to go through the thalamus first. Who's going to decide if it's important enough for our consciousness to actually pay attention to or not. All right, that's useful. So when we talk about these sensory receptors, which are really types of endings of sensory neurons, there are four categories. The first one listed here is chemoreceptors. We've talked about chemoreceptors before. 
they will send specific molecules or chemicals, right? So we talked about the chemoreceptors in the aorta and the carotid that are able to sense pH, because you might remember that pH is the concentration of hydrogen ions. That's the chemical that they're sensing, right? So they sense pH, they send that information to the medulla oblongata that will trigger us to breathe. So chemoreceptors are also responsible for a lot of other senses. So not only our ability to sense pH inside our blood vessels, but several other things that we'll talk about today. Photoreceptors, like you might think, respond to different wavelengths of UV light. Okay. Great album, by the way, if you don't know. Okay. So that kind of makes sense. Photo, like photography, right? getting an image, they respond to light. We really only use those for vision, okay? Mechanoreceptors, so think of these like mechanics, physical things. So they respond to touch, pressure, vibration, movement, stretch, right? So mechanical forces, physical things. And then finally, thermoreceptors, thermo, like, like a thermos, think about heat, temperature. Right? So they're going to pay attention to temperature, how hot or cold something is. So when we talk about our different senses, different types of senses are going to use different types of receptors here. Right? So our chemoreceptors for chemicals or molecules. Our photoreceptors are for light. Mechanoreceptors, mechano right? so physical mechanical forces like touch and pressure. And then thermal receptors for temperature. Okay, so we're going to start with kind of the general sensory receptors first, and then we'll get into like taste and smell and vision, the more specialized ones after that. So we're going to talk about kind of some general sensory things. The first one is proprioception. I love proprioception. Proprioception is the ability to know where different parts of your body are and how they are positioned. And the way we do this is we have mechanoreceptors in our muscles and tendons and ligaments. And what they do is they sense stretch. So for example, right now, my elbow is bent. There's a muscle here called the triceps. Its tendon inserts here. When I do this, it is stretched. So the proprioceptors in my triceps, tendon, and muscle are sensing that stretch. The proprioceptors in my biceps muscle are sensing that there is no stretch. That is how I know that my elbow is bent. That's how I can feel where my body parts are at any given moment in relationship to each other. Okay. which is really important, actually, okay? It's really important to know where your body parts are in space and in time, all right? She better know exactly where all of her body parts are, right? If she wants to even think about landing on the beam, right? So knowing exactly where everything is and being able to sense that and sense where your center of balance is, Right? This is all proprioception. If you've ever had uh, a lot of injuries, especially ankle sprains, one of the rehabilitation exercises that they'll often do is have you work on proprioception. So they'll have you do these wobble boards and other things to help fine tune your sense of proprioception, your ability to sense, is my ankle a little bit crooked? Is it straight? Am I terminated? Am I, you know, where am I? Where, how is my ankle physically situated right in this moment? And that's actually been shown to be really, really helpful in preventing future injuries. So proprioceptive training, right? This is really cool, actually. Lots of our senses we can train to become more accurate, right? And to give us better information. So, for example, if you've ever been to a dance class, right? And there's that big mirror. And it's not just because dancers just love to look at themselves in the mirror. It's actually helping them train their proprioception. Then, you know, they might be like, well, my elbow is great. And then they look in the mirror and they're like, oh, right? So helping them kind of fine tune their proprioception about where things are. 
So it's something that we can kind of exercise and improve, which is neat. Super important are proprioceptors. Now, next batch, so proprioceptors are one category. And they're all over in our muscles and tendons. Then we also have cutaneous receptors. So cutaneous means of the skin. And we have several basic types. Okay? So these are receptors in the skin. We have mechanoreceptors for things like light touch and pressure. And interestingly, those are two different types of things that are sensed by two different types of receptors. So light touch <coughs> excuse me, and pressure. We, of course, have thermoreceptors to sense temperature. And we have chemoreceptors in our skin and in many of our tissues. You might think, well, what kinds of chemicals would I be sensing in my skin? The most common types of chemoreceptors that we have in our skin are actually receptors that allow us to perceive pain. And they have a special name. They're called nociceptors, N-O-C-I. So nociceptors are a specialized form of chemoreceptors that are what we use to sense pain. We're going to talk more about that in a minute because pain is actually kind of really important for a lot of reasons. Okay. So we have these cutaneous receptors, and there's all different types of receptor endings here, and I'm not going to make you memorize them because you'll just forget them. That's not useful. Just know there's lots of different types for different types of sensations in your skin. Right. The other thing about the cutaneous receptors is they are not evenly distributed. There are parts of our bodies where they are very densely packed, right? So if you have a lot of sensory receptors in one area, that's an area of your body that's really sensitive. Right? You can get a lot of information a lot of granularity and specificity. It's like having better resolution on your computer or TV screen. It's like having more pixels. You have more granular information, more data points that you can bring in to give you information. So our fingertips actually have tons of cutaneous receptors on them. Very, very dense, which is why you know, if you want to feel the surface of something, you don't rub your forearm on it, right? You're actually going to feel it with your fingertips because that's where we can get the most information, right? If I want to feel the texture of something, right, I can tell the difference in texture between these two. I could have been having all kinds of fun this whole semester, and I've only just recognized it. Okay, so you can tell a lot about different things because we have all this high-density receptors. There are other parts of my skin, like on my back, where I have very few sensory receptors. Very few. And in fact, for fun, you can take a little bit of fishing line, or as long as you're not too rough with it, a safe, or not a safety pin, a paper clip that you open up. So you have a little tiny thing, or you can even use a ballpoint pen. Have somebody close their eyes, do this on their back, and touch them and see if they can feel it. And just move it just a millimeter each time. And there'll be some places where they can feel it, and some places where they can't. Because there's just no nerve ending there. Right? Just, because we don't really need very specific information usually from our back. Yeah. Fun game you can do where you draw someone's back and they have to try and draw what you're drawing without looking at it, but just by feeling it. <laughs> so that's good. That would be really fun, right? Draw something on somebody's back and then they try to draw it as you draw it, just by what they feel. It would be neat if then you did that and then you had them, then you drew it like on their palm. They'd be much better at it if you did it on their palm. Okay. So some parts of our body have lots of nerve endings and some parts have very few. So that's going to be really important. So I'm going to spend some time on pain or nociception right now. Certainly from a medical standpoint, that's something that's of a lot of uh, importance to us. And um, as we go about our lives, it can be really useful to understand how pain happens and why. So I mentioned that nociceptors are a type of chemoreceptor, right? So chemoreceptors are always sensing a certain type of chemical or molecule. 
And most of our chemoreceptors that are nociceptors are sensing a molecule, a type of molecule called prostaglandins. Prostaglandins are very interesting. They tend to be released when cells are damaged. Okay, so if I pinch my skin, I just damaged some of my cells. And when I did that, they released prostaglandins. My nociceptors sensed that prostaglandin molecule and sent a signal. That's how you feel pain. Isn't that crazy? So you're actually detecting the, the tears of my cells, right? The little things that leak out when they get hurt. Right? The molecules that they produce when they're injured. So pain is meant to be a useful signal to us that damage is happening, right? So then we can be like, oh, maybe there's a rock in my shoe. Or, oh, maybe I shouldn't saw my arm off with that knife or whatever it might be, right? So it gives you information that there's some type of damage happening to the cells, some type of damage happening to your tissues. So I don't want you to pay attention to all these things here, right? Obviously, it's really complicated. The thing that I want you to know is that with tissue injury often releases prostaglandins that then will stimulate this chemoreceptor, which is then going to send a signal to the spinal cord. And then it'll get relayed up to the brain. Yeah. Yes. So if I wanted to be mean and just give somebody an injection of some prostaglandins into their tissue, that would cause pain. Absolutely. <laughs> no, I won't do that on purpose, right? Yes. Right? So you could reproduce that sensation of pain just by giving prostaglandins right, into somebody's tissue. And those chemoreceptors, they don't know the difference. They're like, oh, prostaglandin. I detect it. I send my signal. And then your brain perceives it. It's pain. So the pathway here, right, so you have your prostaglandin. This is the axon of my sensory neuron. Here is my interneuron in the spinal cord. And then it's going to send a signal up to the brain. And specifically for my body parts, that's going to go to the somatosensory cortex. That's this part of the parietal lobe of the brain. So you might remember when we talked about the brain, we talked about how the parietal lobe receives sensory information from the body. Okay, so that somatosensory cortex, that part of the cerebrum, that part of the parietal lobe, is where that goes. And depending on which part of the body it's from, it's going to go to different parts of this cortex, right? So if I'm pinching my left hand, which side of my brain is that signal going to go to? The right, okay? So my right parietal lobe is going to sense it in the part of my brain that receives sensory information from my hand, which is a different part than the part that receives sensory information from my leg. So I could also just poke somebody's brain in different parts, and they'd be like, oh, it feels like you're touching my elbow. Oh, it feels like you're touching my toe. So uh, there are some people who just don't sense pain. Does that mean there's something wrong with like the wiring? So that's a really good question. So the question is, there are some people who just don't sense pain. It's really, really rare because it's evolutionarily a bad idea to not be able to sense pain. And actually, what happens in the rare cases that this happens is usually, if it's not diagnosed early on, the infants will go blind because how often do we rub our eyes? Right? And what happens is nothing hurts. So they rub them really hard. And sometimes they scratch them with their little fingernails. So actually, infants who are born with this condition often go blind because of trauma to the eye because they don't know that they're causing damage. So your question in terms of what causes that, is it something in the brain that's not working? I think it's the nociceptors themselves that don't work. But I'll double check. They actually have a genetic defect in their nociceptors. So they can feel other things, but they can't feel pain. So when they have like, pain tolerance, is that just more, I guess, attitude based? So pain tolerance is a different thing, and we're going to get to that. All right. 
So we have this whole sequence of events, and we're like, ouch, my hand hurts, right? Which is a useful signal to see what's going on because something is causing damage, and so we want to attend to that. Pain is a useful signal most of the time. Childbirth would be the exception. <laughs> All right, so we have different ways to treat pain. One of them you've already learned about, so we're going to talk about that second. But the first one is your friend Motrin or Advil, ibuprofen. The way ibuprofen works, and aspirin too, is it actually interferes with your cell's ability to make prostaglandins. So even though your cell or tissue is damaged, it can't then produce and release prostaglandins. Therefore, the chemoreceptors don't get a signal. Therefore, you don't perceive as much pain. That is how they work, okay? So, ibuprofen and aspirin, and naproxen too, naproxen. All three of those work the same way. They block the production of prostaglandins. And so that's how they reduce pain. You lose that chemical signal that says, oh, there's damage happening, because you're like, I know, I know. <laughs> now this is totally different from an anesthetic. Okay, so an anesthetic is a medicine that we use to block pain. And so remember, lidocaine doesn't work at the tissue cell level. It works on the sensory neuron. Remember, lidocaine blocks those sodium gates on the axon of the sensory neuron. So even though the sensory neuron is picking up prostaglandin, it can't send a signal to the spinal cord because it can't do the action potential. It can't do the depolarization. It can't do the <laughs> down the length of the axon when the sodium ions rushing in and causing a movement of charged particles. All right, so that's a different way to block pain. Kind of neat. So our perception of pain, though, is going to vary a lot. So this can against the Paul's comment. Right? There's lots of different factors that influence our experience of pain. Some of it is how many prostaglandins we're producing. Some people produce more than others in response to the same degree of injury. Okay? How well are our sensory neurons sending that signal? Right? Obviously, if you have lidocaine on board, not very well. Right? Do different people have different Levels of functionality of their sensory neurons, that's harder to measure. Don't know. Okay. Our actual experience of pain is also dependent on a lot of other things going on up in our brain. So, are we depressed or anxious? Do we expect something to hurt? If we expect it to hurt, we are more likely to experience pain. So when I had to give stitches to little kids, and I worked in a pediatric emergency room for a while, and I would have to give them lidocaine. Now, when you give somebody lidocaine, it burns. And so I would say to them, I'm going to give you some magic medicine, and it's going to tingle. And the tingling is how you know the magic is working. And much of the time, not all the time, but much of the time, right, I'd be like, do you feel it tingling? And they're like, yes, I do, right? <laughs> so you can kind of subvert somebody's experience of pain by setting up certain expectations, which is fascinating, right? So there's a lot that's going on kind of psychologically that has a huge influence on how you perceive pain. But one other thing is the degree to which you are getting additional sensory inputs from that same region. So what do you do when you bang your shin on something? What do you usually do? Swear. Swear, right? But then what do you do physically? Often. You rub it. Yeah, right? You hold it or you rub it. And what that does is it sends pressure signals 
through the pressure sensory receptors, which are different than the chemoreceptors for pain, these are mechanoreceptors, they send so many signals through the spinal cord that it actually can drown out the pain signal. So when something hurts and you hold it, that's helping to reduce how much pain your brain ends up perceiving. Yeah. Ooh, is that how adrenaline does it? No, adrenaline ramps up your thalamus. It's like, we are not paying attention to any extraneous information right now. So we need to fight or flight. So adrenaline is different. Yeah, good question. So there's a reason why when something hurts, you hold it or you rub it. It actually helps decrease how much pain your brain perceives in the end. So I want to share with you um, a great little video of a doctor giving shots to a toddler. And you're going to watch him set up the expectation <laughs> brilliantly. Okay, so this video shows you the power of distraction, right? So this physician is able to give vaccines, injections to this little baby uh, quite successfully and distract him from his pain. The other thing I want to talk about is somatic versus visceral pain. So somatic sensation refers to the sensory information that we get from our muscles, ligaments, tendons, and our skin. It tends to be really specific. It gives you very precise information about what's going on. Our inner organs, however, our squishy bits, are our viscera. And the sensory signals that we get from those are kind of vague and diffuse, very nonspecific. So if you have a, you know, so the classic um, presentation actually of appendicitis, right? So remember the appendix is that little worm-shaped thing that hangs down off the large intestine in the lower right side of your abdomen. In the early stages of appendicitis, when the appendix is inflamed and infected and painful, you don't actually feel pain down in your lower right abdomen usually. You just kind of have this vague, strange abdominal pain, usually centered kind of around your belly button, which is not at all where the pain is actually coming from. That is the visceral pain. It's very nonspecific. The brain doesn't really know what to make of it. It's just something feels off and you can't really precisely locate it or describe it very precisely. As the appendicitis worsens, however, and the appendix becomes more swollen, it tends to irritate then your abdominal wall. So the, the body wall right next to the appendix, which has somatic nerves. And so then all of a sudden you start being like, wow, actually I have this sharp pain down in my lower right abdomen. So that's kind of the classic evolution of pain from appendicitis is it starts out just kind of very vague, diffuse somewhere around your belly button. That's just the visceral pain. And then as it starts to irritate your abdominal wall, which has somatic nerve endings, then you can localize it more precisely and describe it more precisely. Another interesting thing about somatic versus visceral pain signals is that sometimes actually the brain confuses them because the nerve endings that are coming in from certain squishy bits from certain viscera tend to enter the spinal cord at the same place as nerve endings from different parts of our body that have somatic sensation and sometimes the brain gets them confused. So this causes something that we call in medicine referred pain. So if you've ever heard that the symptoms of a heart attack, for example, can include pain radiating or shooting down your left arm or up into your left jaw, that is referred pain. So it happens because the visceral nerves from your heart enter the spinal cord at the same place as the somatic nerves from your left arm and jaw area. And so your brain sometimes just thinks, well, you know, it never gets any messages from your heart usually. You don't get pain messages from your heart very often. So it just assumes, right, he sees that area code and just assumes it's a call from your mother, for example, right? So it just assumes that it's pain coming from the arm. Similar, similarly, you can see in the woman on the top, 
uh, pain from the liver and gallbladder up in the upper right part of the abdomen, so coming from those viscera, often gets misinterpreted by the brain as pain coming from the somatic nerves that supply the right shoulder. And in fact, there are people who have ended up getting shoulder surgeries or shoulder injections or things to treat shoulder pain, and it just wasn't getting better and no matter what they tried. And then ultimately they found out, oh, actually, you have gallstones, right? You have a problem with your gallbladder or your liver, and it was causing this referred pain. The uh, uterus, interestingly, also a site of referred pain for the uterus is the low back. So it's not uncommon with menstrual cramps, sometimes for people to sense pain in the low back rather than in the lower abdomen or front of the pelvis. And if you've ever heard of back labor, a woman in labor, in childbirth, having a lot of back pain, that is for that same reason. So referred pain is something we need to be aware of, it's like kind of crossing your wires, so to speak. So now we're going to move to the special senses. So now we're going to talk about taste and smell and hearing and vision. And so we have special organs for these, and so they're a little bit more complex. We'll start with taste, which is actually the simplest of all of them. So obviously you know this, um, taste receptors are called taste buds and they are located on the tongue. Now these taste buds, these receptor cells, are chemoreceptors. When we talk about those four different types of receptors, they are chemoreceptors. And you have multiple different types of chemoreceptors for different types of chemicals, right, so that you can sense them. We have about four or five, the debate is still raging about umami, um, uh, types of things that we can taste or perceive from our taste buds, right? So we can taste sweet, salty, sour, bitter, and probably umami, which is this kind of savory taste. What's really interesting is that in order to be able to sense a certain chemical and its taste, you have to have the receptor that is specific for that chemical. And if you don't have the chemoreceptor for it, then you can't taste it. So in class, I actually had little pieces of paper that have a certain chemical on it called phenylthiourea. And some people have the receptors to be able to taste it, and some people don't. It has a bitter taste to it. And in class, about half the people who tasted the paper could taste it, and the other half did not. So this is the same reason why some people really don't like the taste of cilantro, and that's because they are able to sense the taste of a molecule that is unpleasant that other people just don't taste because they don't have the receptor for it. They don't have the chemoreceptor for it. So uh, this tends to be genetic and run in families, right? So either you have it or you don't. Now, we used to think that different regions of the tongue were better at sensing certain tastes than others. Um, and we used to do experiments with Q-tips with different solutions, and you'd touch it to different parts of your tongues and see where you could perceive the taste most strongly. Um, this has largely been proven to be a myth and likely just due to the power of suggestion. <laughs> so this does not seem to actually be true. So if you've seen that or you learned that in high school or elementary school, um, yeah, our evidence no longer supports this idea. So once the chemoreceptors sense the presence of a certain molecule, right, they will send an action potential down their axon to the brain, where it will then reach an interneuron in the brain, specifically in the region of the brain called the gustatory or taste cortex, or the taste or gustatory region, which is also in the parietal lobe. So the parietal lobe is this area here. And we already talked about the somatosensory cortex, which is where we receive sensory information from the different parts of the body. And then now we have taste um, or gustatory region or cortex. So that's where you actually perceive a flavor. Now, here's the thing. I just said we only have four or probably five actual tastes, right? Just sweet, salty, sour, bitter, and umami. But 
If I give you a jelly belly, you can tell me, oh, I think this is sour apple, or oh, this is definitely cherry, or this one is root beer. And those are more than a combination of just sweet, salty, sour, bitter, and umami flavors. So how do we actually perceive the flavors of different types of foods, right? Because we only have these five to work with. So how do you actually know the difference between strawberry and raspberry, for example? They're both pretty sweet and usually not terribly sour, especially if it's a candy. If it's a real life one, it might be sour a little bit. It turns out that actually a lot of what we perceive as flavor or taste is smell. So when we are uh, presented with a food, some of the odor molecules from the food come in through our nose. But some actually come from our mouth and then up the back of the throat and into the nose that way. So as you're chewing, as you're swallowing, as you're slurping, right? Some of those molecules are drifting up into your nose where they are going to stimulate the receptors for your sense of smell. So smell is also called olfaction. And so a lot of what we think of as taste or our ability to perceive flavor is actually not taste, it's actually smell. So if you don't believe me, there's an experiment that you can do. You can cut up a few slices of onion and a few slices of an apple and then blindfold a willing participant and have them plug their nose. And they have to plug it really, really well, no cheating, right? But really plug their nose, um, you know, in the front and kind of towards the back a little bit too, because you want to interfere with the ability of air to get up through the back of the throat and have them take a bite. And most people, unless it's a particularly pungent onion, most people will not be able to tell the difference between an onion and an apple. Because believe it or not, there actually are some sugars in onion. They are slightly sweet, especially if it's a Vidalia. And um, so without that sense of smell, we actually can't tell the difference. The texture is very similar. All right, so let's talk about smell then. So uh, the fancy name for it is olfaction. So our, our olfactory cells, which are the receptor cells for the sense of smell, live high up in the nasal cavity, right? So they're way up here at the top of the nose and they are chemoreceptors. So just like taste, they're chemoreceptors, except they're for different molecules. And for the sense of smell, for odors, right? There are hundreds of different types of molecules that we need to have receptors for, right? There's all different types of odorant molecules. And any smell that we perceive is usually a mixture of multiple different chemicals or odor molecules um, that then together combine to form what we uh, would say, oh, this smells like root beer, <laughs> or oh, this smells like patchouli, for example. Um, multiple different chemicals together. There are a few odors that are just, you know, kind of one chemical molecule. So the smell of asparagus, that is one molecule that you are smelling. Um, same with hydrogen sulfide, which is that kind of uh, rotten egg smell um, that you can get from farts or sewage or <laughs> um, rotten eggs. Uh, that's hydrogen sulfide. That's one molecule. Um, but usually when we're like, oh, I smell such and such, it's often a combination of multiple different odorant molecules. So these cells, and they've kind of shown them as different colors here to say each different color is responsible for receiving a different type of odor molecule, right, then are going to send their signals into this yellow thing here. And this is the olfactory bulb. And this sits on the base of the brain. And it's where we're going to find some interneurons. They're then going to send the signal back into the brain. So here we can see that a little bit more clearly. So again, our um, odor receiving cells, the chemoreceptors are located very high up in the nose. And then once they receive that signal from those chemical molecules, they send it to the olfactory bulb here, which is then going to send it back to the brain. Now what's interesting about the sense of smell is it's gonna send it to two places. 
one is to the primary olfactory area or primary olfactory cortex, which is in the temporal lobe of the cerebrum. And that's the cells in our brain that say, oh, I smell this thing, <laughs> right? But we also send signals back here, this other part of the brain that we haven't talked about yet, and it's called the limbic system. And the limbic system, which sits right near the thalamus, here's the thalamus here, is responsible for emotions and memories. And so this is really interesting because it makes the power of our olfactory sense or our sense of smell especially powerful because it also has the ability to evoke so many memories and emotions. Um, so it's just really fascinating how the sense of smell can really kind of take you back to a certain time or a place or make you feel a certain way. So sometimes when we talk about comfort foods, yes, sometimes it's just because it just feels really good in your belly. But a lot of times it's some of the emotional responses that we have to the odors, to the smells of that food. So this image here is from the scene uh, from the movie Ratatouille, uh, which if you've ever seen is, is delightful. And so the next slide will have a link to that video clip if you kind of want to see an example of a food triggering a very powerful memory and emotion. So we're going to get started on hearing, okay? We're, and we're going to talk about both hearing and equilibrium because both of them are actually coming from our ears, okay? So equilibrium meaning your sense of whether you are upright, on your side, upside down, whether you are moving or whether you are standing still, okay? That's your equilibrium. So hearing and equilibrium are both done in the ear. Oh, there we go. So I just want to show you a few features of the ear. The part we have on the outside, you put your mask straps around, that's called the pinna, right? So that outer ear is called the pinna, P-I-N-N-A, not like Cinna from Hunger Games. And then you have this canal, which is where you can put a Q-tip, but we recommend that you don't, right? So then you have your ear canal, and that leads to this here, which is the tympanic membrane. That's your eardrum, okay, tympanic membrane. And that is a clear, it's so pretty, it's really pretty when it's healthy. It's just this clear, kind of slightly pearly little membrane. It's like a little window there, okay? On the other side of your eardrum, or the tympanic membrane, are three little tiny bones, the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. Three little bones. And what they do is they act as an amplification signal to transmit vibrations to this here, which is the organ that does both hearing through the cochlea and equilibrium, mostly through the semicircular canal. So, I know you're like, what? We'll go through it. So first we have to talk a little bit about what sound is anyway. What are we perceiving when we perceive sound? What makes a noise? Good, vibration, right? So, you know, if you've ever been to a concert and it's like really loud or you're going in your friend's car and they like turn the bass up really loud, you just feel it, right? You can feel your body vibrate. Sound is vibration. Sound is pressure waves moving through the air. Right? So you've seen sometimes like, you know, footage of like a speaker and it's going like this, right? It's causing vibrations in the air. My vocal cords are coming together in specific ways at specific frequencies to cause vibrations of the column of air that is leaving my mouth. Crazy. <laughs> it's amazing what sound is. Right? And so, did you ever do that thing where, so sound can travel through lots of different mediums. So we're most accustomed to it traveling through air and through the air molecules around all of us, right? But did you, maybe, I don't know, I grew up in the 70s and the times were very different back then, but we used to play near the railroad tracks. And so, 
if you wanted to cross the railroad tracks and you want to get an idea if a train was coming, what do you do? Feel the tracks. You could feel the tracks, or even better, you can put your ear down on the tracks. Because you will hear it through the solid steel of the rails before you will hear it through the air. Certain things conduct those sound waves, those vibrations, those pressure waves a little bit better than others. So you know how sometimes, um, oh, like you, uh, if you lay down on your bed at night, on your stomach, and your ear to the mattress, if you don't have like one of those foam top ones, can you hear your heartbeat, right? So the sound can travel really well through the mattress, depending on what the mattress is made out of. Okay. So sound is waves of pressure, right? So poof, 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 right? These little And so then we make that into a wave diagram. It's like here's a lot of air molecules, here's not a lot, here's a lot, here's not a lot, here's a lot, here's not a lot, okay? Which is kind of like wacky to think about. And then depending on the frequency, right, how fast these vibrational waves are coming at you, that determines the pitch. So really high frequency, <laughs> right? Really, really high frequency, really, really high pitch. Low frequency gives you a low pitch. Okay. The amplitude, which is how high the wave goes, not how frequently it goes, is the volume. So when I talk quietly, my waves are smaller in amplitude, right? When I talk more loudly, it's larger amplitude. So frequency gives you pitch. Amplitude of the sound waves gives you volume. So those are some of the two factors that we're going to need to be able to perceive. Right? Now you're like, I don't see the air molecules around me pulsating at a certain frequency. Well, these frequencies are super duper fast. Okay? So one of the lowest notes we can hear this is on the bass clef, 66 cycles per second. Per second, super, super fast. These are super fast vibrations happening, right? This is, you know, what I would sing is an alto, right? 262 to 524 cycles per second. Really, really fast vibrations for what humans can perceive. So these sound waves, these vibrations, travel through our ear canal. They get funneled by the pinna into the ear canal and aimed by the shape of the ear at the eardrum. Right? And if you've ever um, been around a drum set, right? you think about the, the, the surface of the drum, and if there's something loud that happens, sometimes that surface of that drum starts to vibrate. That's what our eardrum does. So those vibrations will move the eardrum, which then pushes on the malleus, the incus, and the stapes, the three little bones called ossicles. Right? And then they're going to amplify and transmit that vibration to the inner ear, this purple part right here. So then we have to think about what then what happens? <laughs> How do we convert a frequency of vibration into our experience of pitch and volume? How does that actually happen? Oh, oh yeah. This part, this snail-like part, is called the cochlea. It's called the cochlea. I just think it looks like turtle. All right. So the thing that's going to be important here is something called resonance. I'm going to try to um, explain that. So every object has a natural frequency at which it's exposed to sound of that wavelength, of that frequency. It will start to vibrate and move in reaction to that frequency of vibration. You're like, what? <laughs> so I'm not a physics professor. <laughs> like, I can tell. Okay, so everything has a frequency at which it will vibrate, right? So different strings in an instrument have different inherent natural resonances. 
you might be like, what? 